this is just a quick video to bring a couple of updates and a little bit of correction on my assumptions in the last one and let it be a lesson to everybody that if you assume something it can make an ass out of you and me <laughs> I'll explain that in a little bit but first of all I wanted to uh, look at Nightcap on Minjimble and their current post on the 5th of April shows three people you had three people go out there and listen to your always enthralling speech did you Mark McMurtry <laughs> well all they needed to do was listen to one of your videos and all that's all you do is repeat 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 you're not an original talker or thinker you're just a parrot so always enthralling no actually always boring for most people you actually are if they haven't heard any of this concept before you might enthrall them but once they look into it they'll realize that you're just as full of it as a blocked up toilet anyway the thing that actually interested me was this 23rd of March update that Nightcap on Minjimble updated their website address and I thought well I'd looked at that a couple of days ago and I didn't notice much had been updated so I went there and had a look and I was like well what have you updated and oops you can't see it at the top of the thing because of the way that I viewed the screen now <laughs> sorry but up at the top of the screen that you can't see is a thing that says click here for important information relating to online comment on this project and it's got a little go button it's only a little thin strip across the top and so I did click on that go button now this was originally on their website or oh, months ago and then it disappeared and now it's back again but it's not so bold and so you click on it and what is it oh important information regarding online comments on this project and so you go further down it's just so the important information about the project is yet again about their legal wranglings with Gillian Norman and the thing that I actually objected to here is their constant insistence that for a time G Linda was a prospective member now the thing is that she was not a prospective member she was a member she paid a hundred and twenty thousand dollars and was a member just as much a member as anybody else now if she wasn't a member and hadn't paid that hundred and twenty dollars a hundred and twenty thousand she wouldn't be looking at getting her money back as a member in that trust uh, out of the liquidation of 3222 Kygel Road so if she was only a prospective member she would have no claim on the liquidation none whatsoever no prospective members can only the trust creditors and creditor invoices can be looked at she is not a prospective well she was not a prospective member she was a member so I just wanted to clarify that for people the second thing that they've actually got wrong here is for many reasons including where the community felt her values where her values lay and having undertaken unauthorized and unapproved building work on land now the thing being that you can hear in the voxes that Mark Darwin was putting in stumps he's you know cutting a slab he's building his house Phil Ameta had built uh, a yurt and there were other people there I uh, can't remember her name offhand I think it was Melissa that had actually built there too now from what I understand Gillian Norman didn't actually build anything she was there in a mobile home one that she claimed that they broke into and removed it from the property and she never saw it again and that was a fairly expensive mobile home that they as anybody evicting someone from the land a landlord has to follow the rules you cannot just go and break into someone's car or house 
or anything and do anything unless you have the proper authorization to do it and you've gone through the proper process they with Gillian Norman's mobile home they didn't do the legal process they broke into her vehicle and they removed her vehicle and she never as far as I know she doesn't even know what happened to it so that probably ended up somewhere in Lismore or some other chop shop where you know stolen vehicles and things like that end up uh, but so when they're saying that she was undertaking unauthorized and unapproved building work that is completely false as far as I am aware she never did any undertaking of any unauthorized work or building the only unauthorized part for all of them out there was illegal habitation of the land she's in a mobile home Mark Darwin's in a caravan I could actually show you a picture of his caravan where he's actually built um, a shelter around it uh, I could even show you a picture of Philometta's yurt and all these other constructions that were out there that were actually unauthorized and unapproved building and not one of those belongs to Gillian Linda Norman so I just thought I'd point that out too now when they point out here about Justice Fagan and how he pointed out about Gillian Norman's behavior and how they pulled this quote out well I really do suggest to people that you go and read the judgment because read what the judge said about the utterly incompetent developers that it was an absolute farce the way that they conducted things so while they're making out that oh look you know Gillian Norman is utterly rejected and you know dumbfounded he couldn't understand this that and the other the judge was equally dumbfounded by the the developers <laughs> so you know it's not a good judgment and it's certainly not something that look if I'm going to promote my business I'm not going to stick up all my legal cases as the only defense I've got look I'm doing the right thing because look we've got we've got this judgment against her we proved we were right because we got this judgment against her it's unless you're selling a legal service I really don't care this might be something to do with the behavior of those people involved back in 2014 that are still involved now and uh, you really need to read the judgment if you want to know what the nightcap on Minjimbal developers are like what you can expect out of them read the judgment that's attached right here down here we'll go down over here they give it to you you don't even have to <laughs> go looking for it read it read the judgment and find out what Justice Fagan said about them and why they wouldn't quote that in their join us and you know don't listen to anything that's been said online because these things are you know <laughs> sorry uh, yeah I just get a little bit sick and tired of these people just they're flogging Gillian Norman's judgment and injunction to death they are using it in every single circumstance to justify we're not doing the wrong thing well I tell you what you only answered her accusations and she didn't present them very well and everybody knows that everybody knows why Gillian Norman failed not because she was wrong but because she couldn't prove it because she just couldn't get past the first stage of of presenting the evidence properly that's what happens when you self defend and you do not use your pro bono lawyer that was given to you 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 just you got a fool for a client especially Julia Norman when she tried to defend herself and even handle the defense now in this case she did actually get a lawyer to come in and take over the case 
And the judge was really happy about that because he thought that the proceedings would actually go ahead. But then, you know, actually I might be getting the cases confused here because she's got a few of them out there. But anyway, um, the point being is that the only reason that she failed is because she failed to present the evidence. Not that the evidence wasn't there, but she failed to present it in an acceptable manner to the court. So, and they know this, which is why they spend all this time, not only on their FAQ page, where all of this is focused on, and it's actually made to be focused on publicly because they've actually got it on their website. And if it wasn't such a big issue for them and a common question, why would they even have it here? Well, that's the thing. Because the purpose of this note is to address repeated inquiries being received by Nightcap surrounding online publications. Well, if you're going to Nightcap on Minjimbal to ask for questions about what's going on, you'll get a sales pitch. You won't get upfront honest answers. You will get told what you need to hear to make you part with your money. That's as simple as that. And if you've got as far as going on tour, you've already got, they've already got you half hooked. Because what idiot pays $500 to go on tour to look at, yes, I might buy this or not. I might invest in this. They actually want you, the customer, to pay to look at what they've got for sale. That's just an absolute goal. And the fact that anyone would pay $500 to go on a tour, it's like, huh, they've got to be half, you know, half there. No one that's all there is actually going to say, yeah, I'll pay $500 to come and see what you've got for sale. I mean, you walk into any shop, do you have to pay to walk into the shop to look to see what they've got for sale? No, they want you to come in for free, have a look around and maybe they might make a sale. But you see, this prerequisite is actually making sure that one, you've got money and two, that you're actually not going to think too much about parting with it. Because anyone that's got any financial common sense is not going to pay $500 for a tour. Oh, but you get the money back if you don't go through. So what? $500? 50 bucks is a fair thing. You know, 500? No, they want to make sure it's 500 because anyone could come up with 50 bucks. But not everyone would be able to come up with 500. So if you could come up with 500, you're probably more than likely willing and able to commit to a financial obligation. And whether that finan and we know that that financial obligation isn't going to be through a bank. It's targeting everybody's self-managed super funds, disposable income that you don't have to get the bank to say, hey, yes, this is a great proposition. We're going to lend you money for this because they know the bank won't lend money for this. It is not a sound proposition and there is no clear title or ownership. And still to this date, back in 2014-15, we have investors at Bulla Bulla that are waiting for a deed, a trust deed that says that they are an actual legal member. They have never produced a legal deed for any of the members. To this day, they are still making drafts. So anyone that's bought in has bought in on a draft that like all of these others, they didn't even have the draft, then they got a draft. But that draft, when it went to court, the judge says, well, you know, this is a bit of a mess and I'm sorry, but uh, no, it's not really a legally drawn up document or lodge document. So we're going to have to deal with it in a different way. We're going to have, to, and this is what created so much complication in the court was actually defining uh, which were part of the trust creditors and when they paid in. Did they pay in in the first place? 
did they pay in to discharge the mortgage or did they pay in after the mortgage was discharged? So the judge looked at it in three different ways simply because the deed of your entitlement was never valid and legal and could not be used. And as I said, to this day, they still do not have a valid and legal one. And so I don't know how many investors out there that have paid money in, you think you've got something that is legal because you signed it? Well, take it to court and you'll find out. You'll, you'll really upset the judge because, yeah, they don't seem to be able to get it right. I mean, it's been six years since they first started trying to draft a deed to title share thing, certificate, and they still can't do it? Why? Because of what they want to create in that title deed is to actually virtually <laughs> separate them from actually having control. As I said, there was, at Bulla Bulla, Adrian Brannock said it. It was a democracy. That doesn't work. This one's going to be a dictatorship. And so in the formatting of the deed certificate for your membership into the community, they want to use that in mind so that they don't have the same issues that they had with all the past lost investors, where you've got certain people that are members but hold all the shares in the companies, and then you've got others that all they've got are empty promises and when they ask, well, what's going on? Where's our share? And you hear from the Voxes too that it's not just Julian Norman. It's Melissa Hirsch and Mary Lou um, Cantrell, I think it is, and Naraya Mu, I think her name is. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just sorry trying to remember the names here. Uh, but there are a lot of people that and mainly women that were saying hey look we've been patient we've been taking our money we've let you you know get away with it up until this point but hey we paid in money we'd like to know how it's been spent is this is supposed to be equal and you're not giving us equal information now where Gillian Norman might have been singled out is that um, her behavior after the event uh, was a little bit different. And they also saw Gillian Norman, I think, as someone that could, uh, that they could take something off. They went after Nicole because she had her public indemnity insurance through the, the legal firm, as any lawyer does carry. And so they knew that they could go after that. And again, AB has said that in the Voxes. So when they talk about this statement here, I would have to say that that statement in itself is very misleading. Gillian Linda Norman was not a prospective member. She was a fully paid up trustee member. And she is entitled to her money back in the liquidation as a trust creditor because she was, still is, a member even though she's not allowed on the land and all this other stuff happened. But, so that perspective member is absolute bullshit. There's nothing perspective about it. And they keep harping on, oh, it's perspective, perspective. It's no, she was an actual member, just like any other member, sitting and waiting for money back in the liquidation. And as for her undertaking unauthorised and unapproved building work, again, she didn't actually build anything. Others did. Mark Darwin did. And again, you can hear through the Voxes, everybody was told by Mark Darwin and Adrian Brennock, yeah, you can build on it. I'm building on there. Come on, let's go build. As far as they knew, it wasn't unauthorised. Only Mark Darwin would have known that it was, and Adrian Brennock would have known it was unauthorised and unapproved building, because they are the ones telling the people that, yeah, it's okay. Because in their mind, you don't need council approval. Again, that's from videos that they've done anyway. So that 
that's enough on that one anyway, because I think I've made my point. <laughs> it's just one of those amazing things where they just keep repeating the same misinformation and thinking that it's going to fly. That's why they have repeated inquiries. And the thing being too is if your repeated inquiries actually, like before they lodged the DA, if you asked where the DA is, you'd get a response back that says, we don't think you'd be a fit for us and we hope you find something somewhere else. As I said, they are looking for very specific people and the $500 that you have to pay up front to go on a tour to see what they've got for sale. I mean, seriously, if that was actually a business running a tour, they couldn't charge 500 bucks for it. And another thing being too, in the Voxes, Mark Darwin and Adrian Brennock complain about how they're not getting paid for anything and that how these tours, they can't run them for free and how Lumber and Horizons owes them all this money. One, the trust creditors never authorised any expenditures. They never asked for certain reimbursements. They just took them. When they say they didn't get any money out of it, that's a load of hogwash. And I will show you that in the financial um, one when I get to that. That'll be another video. You can see clearly... Sorry, it got interrupted. You can see clearly from the accounts that Mark Darwin, remember in the Voxes, or I might not have got to them yet, I... Uh, where he was buying motorbikes and uh, he said, oh, it'd be good if we could claim this back on the company. Well, he did actually. And I can show you that in the accounts for, uh, which one is it? I think it's NCV Enterprises. Not quite sure, but uh, I won't get too much into it. And also on the same accounting, we've got 130,000 for directors and consulting fees for Mark Darwin, Cherie, uh, Cherie Stokes, and uh, oh, was it Cherie? Might have been Philip Dixon. I'm going off memory here. And Adrian Brannock. I know Adrian Brannock and Mark Darwin are definitely in there. There's lots of figures and I don't want to go too much into it here when I haven't got it in front of me and I don't want to get sidetracked with it. But needless to say is that at every stage they have taken money. They got paid wages, they got paid director's fees, and then they turned around and said, well, we want 10% now of what we've bought in in sales. And then they also said after they've been paid wages, salaries and everything, so the work that they do is owned by the investors now that paid for it. And what do they do? They turn around and say, the sales leads are ours. Well, actually, you were paid for those sales leads. They do not belong to the individual. They belong to the investors that actually paid for it. Okay? Paid your wages, paid your director's fees, paid for your rego, paid for your, um, what was the other thing? <laughs> Motorbikes. Paid for your home entertainment package with Foxtel or whatever it was. All of these things that members were paying for. And you say, you're making nothing out of it. Oh, it makes me want to vomit when I hear them say that. They're ripping people off left, right and centre as far as I'm concerned. You know, people are putting in money on one side and they're just taking it out on the other side. Oh, yeah, let's go get some bikes. Oh, look, we deserve a nice, big, fat, juicy commission. And, yeah, we've got a salary as well. Plus, we'll get a director's chunk. So how many times do they want to get paid for doing the same job? Okay, so interesting thing happened last night. <laughs> And it's always something that happens when I say, oh, well, they haven't done anything to my Facebook pages. Bang, boom, next thing. Yup, down it goes. Well, the thing is, my profile's gone, but the pages are still active. 
So bounce back, the one that I've been uploading all my links to, has, um, well, it's still appearing there. May appear there for the next 30 days while they wait for me to not do anything about removing my profile. So, um, yeah, I don't know what's going to go on with that. They've uh, 18 videos now they've censored, 18. There's two links off my private Google Drive that they complained about and got them removed. And now my Facebook. Well, my Facebook profile's gone, but uh, the pages are still there, which, as I said, is a little bit puzzling as to why they are still there when the profile's been blocked but they're not. Anyway, they might be uh, at the end of the 30 days. Not to worry, I'm starting up another and getting it all organized. Uh, you know, it's bounce back. You, you don't put up with, you know, when you got a, a vision, you don't let little hurdles get in the way. Certainly, these creeps don't. They just push on through no matter what or who it hurts. Well, I do care about who gets hurt by other people's actions. That's part of the reason why I'm actually doing what I'm doing now and why I will continue to do it until they are in court answering the charges that will be put against them. And the day that I see someone, a judge's hammer come down and go, guilty that is going to be the best day and the most reward of all i tell you what that's the payment that i'm going to enjoy because i know that the whole community will be freed for all the hundreds of people that these minority extremists affect in such a very negative way how they've trashed the only local shopping area in mount burrell and completely stripped it bare and turned it from a thriving business into a ghost town. That's what they're going to do with Nightcap on Minjimble. They're, they're delivering big promises, but you know that they can't deliver on the development application. No matter how many times they're going to promise you, oh yes we will, and we're constantly working with the council to, you know, towards an uh, approval. They're never going to get approval for something that is in conflict to the only schedule that actually allows them to build in the Tweed Shire Council, and that's the state environmental planning policy. If they cannot use the terms within that policy and be a single lot with no subdivision, you're out. You know, you're out. You just haven't got a song and a prayer. <laughs> but there's even more though. You cannot displace a large wildlife corridor. You cannot destroy heritage sites. There's so many things that you cannot do. And even back in the day of Bulla Bulla, the first town planner, uh, Daryl Anderson Consulting, said it's not going to happen because of the water catchment issues and everything like that. Like basically at the back of 3222, that's where they want to stick a dam in the future. That's what is being thought of. So the last thing they want is to actually have houses in there if they're planning to stick a dam in. So, I mean, the dam in itself would be a completely different issue. But it's also a very big issue as to why, well, for all the other reasons, that one's going to stop it too. So there are multiple issues that they can't actually get around. And, well, let's just say that if they wanted to do 10 different development applications after they had subdivided the 21 lots into 11 lots, put in 10 rural land sharing community DAs, one for each lot, which would then make it one single lot and not being subdivided. Well, technically it was subdivided to get it, but yeah, we'll just skim over that technicality. And once you had 
the 10 rural land sharing community DAs and one for your village, so you've got 11 separate development applications. That might actually be a halfway successful way to trying to achieve what you want to achieve. But then there's also the very big hurdle that the Tweed Shire Council are determined to remove rural land sharing communities from their shire altogether. Any ability to build them ever again, gone. They have been trying for years and they should not have been on the last state environmental planning policy. They should not have been included in, in it. They were actually told in writing by the official government department they would not be included in the SCPP. They were and because of that these people can now use that schedule and say we want to apply for development application of rural land sharing communities under this schedule. Now if you remove that schedule they can't apply for it in the Tweed Shire Council. And the Tweed Shire Council are going to remove it from, they're going to remove themselves from the schedule so it no longer applies to them. Now, they can say, oh, well, that's a grey area because, you know, they've got their DA now in when there's the laws this way. Yeah, fine. And you... Even if you got concept approval for your rural land sharing communities, you still have to resubmit it at a later date under the conditions that exist. The concept may be approved, but it has to work in reality. You actually have to apply for the works. Now, I know that you've probably had lawyers that have told you, oh, you know, it, it's technically speaking, because it was lodged before any law changes, we can make it apply to that. Well, for as much as you can go technically speaking and apply it, others can turn around and say, well, no, it doesn't apply. Because the only thing you had approval for was a concept. Now you want approval for the actual works, it cannot be done. I'll go, oh, but, 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 and they can but as much as they want. Because even if they took them to court and sued them, if they have the money, because you've got to understand that the boys at NICAP are getting a little bit low in money, in cash flow. We've heard it in the Voxes, it's a constant problem, cash flow. <laughs> yeah big problem for them especially now because they're going for bigger ticket items they're spending 725,000 outside of the development rather than on the development so but that they'll just look at that as oh well we're trying to buy up the land around it so that we can turn our small town into a country and I guarantee you they're going to try and set themselves up as a country They've, we've already heard them talk about it in the boxes where, yeah. And the thing is that Adrian Brannock calls people that he would invite in other sovereign nations that have set up as independent. He calls them rat bags. So that's not a very nice term for the kind of people that you want to bring in to your country. Rat bags. Yeah. But you see, they know that, like with the OSTF, you get the sovereignty extremists who go, oh, yes, you know, look, we've got all these issues about what happened hundreds of years ago. Let's fight about it now because we can't change anything. And let's pretend like we're a constant victim because it happened to us and our grandparents or our great-grandparents. And let's just ignore the fact that there are millions of people that are born in Australia that have got just as much right to the land and to be here as anybody else. No matter how long your relatives have been here or how short a time, you're born here, this is your country, this is your land. You are blood of the land. And it doesn't come down to, well, you can't be blood of the land because you're not Aboriginal. You are born on the land where you are, you are blood of that land. And for others to turn around and say, well, you've got no right to it because your great-grandfather or did this or did that is absolutely rubbish. You cannot live in the past. You can only use the present 
and move forward. And if you're constantly living in the past, playing the victim card, that's all you're ever going to be. And you're only ever going to be busted ass, broke, and constantly a victim. Because that's the state you put yourself in, of being a victim. Rather than saying, well, you know what? I'm just like any other Australian that was born here. I have got no more or no less rights than them. And I'm not more entitled to something simply because I've got a little bit more pigmentation in my skin. Well, I've seen Aboriginals that are white, freckled, with red hair. Uh, I know that it's changed about being adopted into the tribes and accepted as part of, you know, you've got to have a certain percentage and everything now. But the thing being is that too many people that I would not classify as tribal people are making a claim on their tribal heritage rather than the majority part that is their heritage. Like I believe I do have Aboriginal in me. And I don't promote that because I am mostly Caucasian. And to actually turn around and promote a very minority part of me as being the majority part of everything that I am and completely ignore my whole, well, that actually just shows how insecure I am and what I don't think of myself, that I have to try and focus on something that is a very small percentage of me to turn myself into a victim. And actually, if you want to watch one on victimhood, go to Awaken with JP. He just put one out on how to um, be a victim. Uh, it, it's probably not one of his better ones because uh, there are some of the people that he does them with, they're, they're not quite as good as what I like him on his own, but still quite good anyway. All right, so I'm going to change the subject here. I nearly forgot about this one. Um, yesterday, or the day before, yesterday, <laughs> my last video, when uh, I did it on the fake or the false date of births and names, I brought up Tatum Catherine McGeary. And you know, I dismissed her. And then shortly after the video, I got uh, contacted with some rather interesting information that Tatum is actually a lawyer and she's actually associated with the sale of 27 Waratah or as locals know it 23 Waratah court and so that that uh, finding that out sort of changed my perspective I mean I dismissed her as well she's irrelevant because she's never come up in anything so obviously she's not connected to anything but Finding out that she's a lawyer and she's actually currently active with Nightcap on Minjimbo, that's made me do a little bit of a double take and think, well, maybe Tatum, need to have a look at your girl and see what's going on because, you know, I thought Billy was out there doing all this stuff, but oh, I don't know. They've got, seemed to, over the years, they've had so many different lawyers and when I show you the accounts there's even lawyers names on there I hadn't even heard of so yes they have lawyers like they had uh, Billy Fitzgerald well I still do I don't know has Tatum McGeary taken over I don't know I'm gonna have to look that one up as I said this is just a correction on the last one but where I dismissed her has been well basically irrelevant because I'd never come across her before but very stupid thing to do especially oh, I felt quite foolish afterwards when I found out <laughs> it's like oh right so she's a lawyer with nightcap okay so that changes my take on things just a little so anyway I'll check into that one and um, yeah I'll bring you updates as I find anything out there we go, it's on that video that I was talking about it. The fake DOBs and names. And actually it had been raised, a query had been raised with me why I didn't put Mark McMurtry on there. Because it does appear that he's, well his name's Mark James McMurtry. He would appear 
to be the same Mark James McMurtry that is born in a different place. But there does actually appear to be two Mark James McMurtry. One actually appears to be something like a dentist or something like that. I'm not completely 100% sure on that though. Uh, it's still one of those iffy things that, um, yeah, I mean, I don't see if all of the others have made up <laughs> names and date of birth, why, you know, the king of the charge wouldn't actually be doing it. Like this, where is he? Always enthralling <laughs> little Mark McMurtry sitting up there. Actually, Mark, you look like you've lost a little bit of weight, have you, mate? Is that because you haven't had enough money to go to the pub? <laughs> hey, you got three investors here that might be buying in. Each one of those must have paid $300. That would have been at least worth a, a carton. <laughs> anyway, enough toying and fun with, with little Mark. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You know that there was someone out your way the other day, Mark, that uh, knows you very well from a few years ago on the Bro Bus Tour. Wonder if you've come across him yet. You've come across any of the elders that he's met up with as well. I'd say that uh, your days are getting numbered, mate, as far as falsely representing the tribes. But I'd say that Dean Rodimer setting up his own well, what did, hang on, that's right, setting up his own tribal council, that actually raised a lot of, of objections from people <laughs> about how dare you, who appointed you to the, a council, you, you can't just go, oh look, I've got a few of my buddies here and we're just going to become a tribal council now, you can become a council, you can become a group, but you can't represent the tribe. I suppose you can if you make up your tribe, you make up things as you go along. Because there was a thing that I learnt when I was living in the area is that most of the Aboriginals don't actually know their culture, their heritage. It's been lost to them. And that's straight out of their own mouth. That's not to say that all of them are, the ones that I encountered did. And I know that they're out there representing like they know something about it when they haven't got a clue. So, uh, yeah, that was when I was still acceptable as, as the white person because I'm okay. Yeah, I was okay as long as I paid. They are not what I'd call true tribal people. They're just like any other people in this planet that are motivated by greed and money and are willing to take off others and just keep taking and taking and taking and taking. There is nothing giving about them except when they're finished taking they will give you the boot <laughs> yeah anyway i think i've yacked on enough today i've uh, covered the things that i wanted to and uh brought the updates and just a final thing too that please any prospective investors they put the judgment on their website Nightcap on Minjin will put the judgment on their website. You do not even have to do any searching for it. Read it. Read it carefully. And if you can't spot it, well, I'd say send me a message to Facebook, but you can always leave one on my YouTube channel. <laughs> and I will give you a copy where I have highlighted every damning thing throughout the whole document that the judges actually said. So it's very easy to then just scroll down the page and even look for the grey bits that show out and go, oh, what did he say there? And read it. And you will read what the judge said about Adrian and Philip and Mark, um, Mark Darwin and their development. And you will also read what he said about Julia Norman. But I have to tell you that from a developer's point of view, if I was going to set up a development, putting this up on my website would actually be the last thing I would do because it is so damning 
against my activities and how I mishandled the situation. I would never put that up there. Never. I'd do everything to try and, oh, look, yeah, more promotion, more good things, more let's get into um, testimonials or anything like that. And speaking of which, where are your testimonials? Where are any testimonials? Like on Bullable website, you had testimonials from all the investors buying in. I do know some of the investors are even lying about their involvement and saying, oh, no, no, we're not involved. I've got nothing to do with it. Too bad, dear, we know. You're on a list. <laughs> and anyway, as I said before, I was going to leave it there and I just kept yakking. Read the judgment if you haven't. It's well worth reading. And you will find out that uh, what they're saying here is a spin to put it back on to making it all seem like it was only just Gillian Norman's imagination. That she had no proof and it was, you know, the judge was flabbergasted that she couldn't get that we're not the same as them over there. Well, that's because the judge didn't have the evidence presented to him to show that. Because if he had, he wouldn't have been flabbergasted. He would have been going, boom, case dismissed, you know, or not case dismissed. You're suing Gillian Norman for damages. You don't get it. And in fact, now that the case has been dismissed, uh, now you can present criminal charges before the court to actually look at it. And that's another thing that the judge said to Gillian Norman in this judgment, that he could only look at the evidence that he pre she presented in court. And there were certainly things that she did present that if they were presented in a different case, like in a criminal case, he would hear them in that situation. But because they were not presented as a criminal case and it wasn't part of that case he can't look at the crimes but clearly by his statement the judge understood there was behavior by the developers that was negligent at best deliberate at worst and he would definitely look at those charges if they were brought before him so you need to read the judgment and understand what is said because everything they're saying about their spin on it they're relying that these little tabs down here aren't clicked on by anybody that you're not going to look at it and now they are bankrupting Gillian Norman in fact I think she's actually just been bankrupted Philip Dixon did it to get his 200,000 plus cost back Adrian Brennock isn't doing it because he's a bankrupt and he can't because his bankruptcy trustee would take that 200000 So I asked his bankruptcy trustee, well, he's now come into $200,000 plus cost worth of expenses that could go to, or income, that could go to pay back his creditor, the ATO, and his bankruptcy trustee, Jason Bettles, said they're not interested in it. They're not interested in over $200,000 worth of money owed to him. Now, it might be a fine point of the law that maybe as a judgment, it may not come under the jurisdiction of the bankruptcy. But I find that a little bit hard to believe because everything during bankruptcy is seizable. And ultimately, there is very few exemptions and I don't think uh, you know winning a court order with two hundred thousand dollars worth of damages in a civil lawsuit would actually apply as a just reason to withhold those two hundred thousand dollars plus costs from the creditor that is owed by Adrian Brunock. Again these are things that uh, will be investigated put forward to have official complaints made against them and that's something that I am looking at moving on within well everything's starting to come together despite all their little you know deleting my videos or blocking my videos and 
blocking my page or my profile. The pages are still up. I just can't uh, post to them. And I, I will, oh, as I said, I will make up another one and uh, start posting there for however long it lasts. <laughs> hey, I don't expect it to last. I don't even expect my channel to last, which reminds me I should upload and get up current on my backup channel because, well, it's only a matter of time as far as I'm concerned before their constant harassment does that. But I tell you what, go ahead and get my channel shut down. It's not going to do you any favours in the long run. You can't undo the actions of 18 false claims that you've made against my videos. 18! 18 lies. Because I know the standard that is required to make a defamation complaint. You have to provide them with details and you have to give them your name and everything. And don't worry, we'll get all that. Because uh, as part of a legal process, I will be able to access that information from YouTube and confirm what I already know. I know Nightcap or Minjimbal are deleting my videos by using Gillian Norman's injunction and judgment and plastering it on me. Like one size fits all. Well, if that was the case, nobody in Australia can talk about Nightcap on Minjimbal at all. Because if it applies to me, it applies to you, it applies to every single person in Australia. And when Billy Fitzgerald made the threat to me and to others that we were breaching her court order and injunction, it's like, how can you do that? He can't. What he did is actually a threat through a lawyer, an illegal threat. And it's supposed to be intimidating and Billy doesn't mind doing it because he'll get paid for it. Well, I'll tell you what, Billy, you will mind once you have to answer for it because you will answer for it. I'm one person, you know. And I've got a, a lot of people certainly helping me, but I pretty much do work on my own at a pace where only one person can work at. So I can't just go bang and there it's done, you know. You might think, oh, I should have it done tomorrow or next week. No, it might actually take me a month. But I'll get there. That's the thing. I don't care about being the hare. I don't mind being the tortoise. Because just remember, it was the tortoise that won the race. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to leave you. <laughs> Catch you next time. Bye.